Welcome back, folks. Sheepdog Smokey here, and customer service is dead. I know I talk about a lot of things, and I mean, I'm really in danger of just becoming a rant channel, and I don't want to do that. I am still working on videos for the history series and other things that are more relevant to what I have said I want to speak about. But today, for the third time this week, my internet service died. The first time it happened, it was back up within maybe 10 minutes, but it still, I had to tell my boss I'm logged out because my internet died. The second time when I reported it, I was actually told by a customer service representative that their internet service is sold as an entertainment product not meant to be used for work. They cannot guarantee connectivity. Now, I understand that the only, thing, the only guarantees in life are death and taxes. And I understand that an internet service provider is going to have technical problems. The service that my office pays for, which is extremely expensive to run everything my office needs to run, still goes down from time to time. But it, those times are few and far between. Mine goes down at least once a week. Now... I have started making sure I comment every time I call them. They're going to get me fired. I have tagged them on social media, letting them know that if I lose my job over this, they will become my employer, and they will employ me to sit on my butt at home because they have cost me to lose the job that I had, and I'm not moving to their state to take up employment with them and fix their, their problems. That, of course, did nothing to persuade them to provide the service that they charged me for. But this is becoming a pattern everywhere I go. You have people who are either so pushy or so don't talk to me that you can't really do anything in a business anymore. I go to a restaurant. And the last time I've actually gone to a restaurant was almost two months, almost three months ago. It was two and a half months ago. It was on my birthday in May. My parents know that I love fajitas, so they took me to a restaurant for fajitas. And I was required, while walking to my table, to wear a mask. I had to have a mask on if I went to get a refill of my drink. But at my table, I didn't have to. I am required at the movie theater, if I go, which I won't, to wear a mask, but I'm allowed to remove it in the movie theater to eat or drink. But please put it back on as soon as you're done taking a bite or getting a drink. At my office, I'm going to be required to wear a mask, but I'm allowed to take it off at my desk or when eating lunch. Those simple things tell me it's not about the virus. It's about virtue signaling and control. You see, if I wear a mask that I know does not block the virus, I am concentrating everything I exhale right by my nose and mouth. If you follow Nola Nurse, N-O-L-A, Nola Nurse on Twitter, she retweeted today, I believe, a post where someone had mentioned a woman was taken to the hospital, told that she had COVID-19 and only days to live. Someone else had her checked for Legionnaire's disease, which that was actually what she was uh, suffering from, and she had caught it because she was wearing a mask all the time. She's now being treated successfully for Legionnaire's disease instead of put on a ventilator for COVID-19, which is not what she has, which would have killed her. I know a couple of doctors who are just adamant that you not question them on anything. One of them worked at an emergency clinic that I went to exactly once. I let the clinic know I would not return as long as that person was employed there. The other one I simply know through my own life. And I can guarantee you, if you ask them about hydroxychloroquine, they would tell you that you're the most evil person in the world for wanting to poison people. If you ask them, 
why do I have to wear a mask that I know does not block virus particles because the virus particles are too small to block? You're told that you want old people dead. If the mask worked, it would truly be a choice. If it worked, which it doesn't, you would be told, here are the types of masks that work. If you fear you may catch the virus, wear one. If you don't, don't. Basically, if you're sick or in the danger demographic, wear a mask. If you are not in that demographic, healthy, or in that demographic and healthy, you are free to not wear a mask. If they worked, it would be, it, you have the choice to wear it, and it works, so why wouldn't you? But they don't. It's about control. Because if they can make people wear masks, then they can say, you can't hold this service. You can't open this business. You can't provide this service or this product without wearing a mask. I have one store that I shop at because so far this is the only store, the only grocery store that has yet to say it is a corporate policy that you must wear a mask. Walmart, of course, has. I believe Kroger has, but they've had other, there are other reasons I don't shop there. Uh, HEB has, as far as I know. Uh, based on the wording of their signage, it would appear that way. And if anyone from HEB or Kroger is watching and it's not true, please let me know. But so far, the smaller chain that I go to simply has, due to state mandate, masks are required to enter a private business. That tells me that their upper management doesn't mind or at least that they are happy to blame the state government. And when the state government says they're no longer needed, they'll be happy to say, well, the state says you don't have to have one, so I guess they're not needed. So at, they're either smart enough to know they don't work or they're laissez-faire enough to say it's not our call to make. I'm in that store perhaps 20 minutes, 25 minutes, once a week, maybe twice if I need a loaf of bread or another gallon of milk. That's it. Okay, I go in, I get my sodas, I get my beef, I get my ham, I get my bread, my cheese, my mayo, whatever I need. I have chickens 20 feet from my door. All the eggs I can eat. More than, really. So I'm not suffering in any way. I've been blessed enough that I've had my job through all this, and I am blessed to still have it. It could have been much worse. My boss could have told me, the office is closed. Your internet is not reliable. I have to let you go. Please come turn in your computer. At which point I would have been calling my auto financer and said, come get the truck. I've been fired. I can't make payments. I would have been telling my insurance company I've lost the truck, so I don't need insurance. I would have been canceling my every bill that I could and then begging the power company, please don't make me have a heat stroke in my own home during the Texas summer. So I know I'm blessed to still have a job. But I'm being forced by economics because I can't give up my paycheck to adhere to a policy that I firmly believe is medically unsound. I flat out told my boss that while working from the office is preferable in some ways because the internet is stronger there. I am closer to the people I would have to report case issues to. I'm able to work more easily with coworkers on an issue. I have a smoker's cough. Yes, I am working on quitting smoking. If I laid them down, cold turkey right now, never had another cigarette in my life, I would have a cough for several years. It's just the way it is when you've stupidly been a smoker for 20 years. But... I can't now say I don't want to make other people uncomfortable because I can't give up my job. 
I cannot give that up. I'm trying to grow this channel in the hopes that one day maybe it does provide just enough that I don't have to work a 9 to 5. I'm not looking to become a Roman Atwood or a Demo Ranch or a Mr. Beast or whatever. I doubt that I have the ability to become that. But if I could grow the channel just enough to bring in just enough revenue every month to pay my bills and put, keep food on my table and maybe buy a new t-shirt and a new book every few weeks. So literally 60 bucks over my bills. I would be ecstatic. I would be making videos three, four, five times a day. I would be put, I would be through American history in a matter of a month moving on to Greco-Roman, Egyptian, Persian, and so many other things. We'd get through world history in a year. I could move on to other social sciences because I would have the free time to sit here every day and discuss things. And perhaps every other day spend it reading and researching so that I could sit here the next day and record videos. I can't do that if the channel doesn't grow. I have put out on Twitter multiple times, although I keep getting booted and having to start over, that I'm trying to grow this channel. Yes, I'm very open. I'd like to grow the channel to the point where it allows for sponsorships, even if it is little mobile games. I'd like to grow the channel so that I get monetized. I'm not using music. I'm not using video clips. I tried that, and I got hit. As a tiny little channel, I got hit. But I've stopped. I have no strikes. I have no issues on YouTube. But I can't grow the channel. And I don't know if that is because what I'm talking about is not interesting. I don't know if that's because I don't share the mindset of enough people. I don't know. And I'm not going to give up. I'll tell you that. I will be making videos until I literally have no voice to make the videos with. I will never be one of those where I put up a graphic or a GIF or a silently running video clip with a computerized voice over it. I can't stand those. I don't watch those. I'm not going to produce those. If I lose my voice, if I become a mute, God forbid I don't quit smoking in time and I have to get uh, a tracheotomy, and then I have the robotic voice, I'll quit then. Because I wouldn't want to inflict that. I would become just a website where I type things out, find things I want to post, and I'll go back to what I was. I'm doing all I can to avoid that. I still post on the website now and then when it is something that I don't feel is enough to make a video on. I have several articles that I've, or postings that I've made that look rather lengthy. If you want to know how hard it is to write a seven minute speech, how hard it is to come up with 20 minutes of material to talk on, write for an hour. And I mean actually write. So if you stop to gather your thoughts or to pluck something out of your memory, stop the timer. Then read that and see how long it takes. I can guarantee you, if you took every word I've said, if you took a transcript of this, it would be multiple pages. The reason is there are so many words in what we say every day. There are so many little words that your brain skips over as you read. That sentence, your brain skips over as you read. Your brain really only picks up your brain skip read. But it knows the word your brain skips over as it reads. If you want proof of that, find one of those where they have taken and transposed letters. Where only the first and last letter of the word are correct in their location, all the other letters belong to the word, but they're out of order. Or perhaps they switch out 
a 3 for an E or a 5 for an S, but you can still just read it easily. That tells you that you don't read the entire word or every single word of a page. Now, I'll admit, yes, right now I'm reading two different books, both fictional. I read the entire Harry Potter series. never took me more than a day per book. But I read, and I was reading silently. I was not reading aloud. I read Deathly Hollows, which I believe is close to the longest, if not the longest order. The Phoenix may have been longer. But I actually read both of those books in eight hours or less each. The audiobook for Deathly Hollows has a 24-hour running time. And I do know, Jim Dale dramatizes a lot, so he takes longer pauses. They have musical things where there will be a topic break in a paragraph, you know, where the beginning of the book, you start with one group of characters. And then in that same chapter, you move to another location with another group of characters, and then another location with another group of characters. It's a scene break. In a movie or a TV show, this is where you fade to black and fade back in. And audiobook readers who read those types, Jim Dale is very good at it, they give those scene breaks audibly. So if Jim Dale was just reading aloud, not dramatizing anything, not doing voices, not doing scene breaks, it might be a 12 to 16 hour runtime. I still finished it much faster. You read so much faster than you talk. And that is because when you are reading, you're the only one who has to understand it. When you're talking, other people have to be able to follow you. And it is more of how you say things than what you say. Getting back on my original topic, had the agent said that, you know, I'm very sorry, we do primarily sell this as, as an entertainment product, but we understand people are working from home, and we're doing everything we can to bring our service back online as quickly as possible, I would not have been as upset. I would have still been upset that the service I pay for, and I pay a good amount of money for it, was extremely unreliable. But I would not have been upset enough to contact the CEO's office and tell him that an agent just told me that I cannot expect reliability from their company. I've worked in retail or some other form of customer service with the exception of two positions for my entire life, okay? When I was a teenager, before I was officially employed, I mowed yards. That is a customer service position. I'm providing service to a customer. At 15, I worked for a little pizzeria, Spinners. And then at 16, I went to work for an amusement park. Then ultimately for a drugstore. From there to other businesses, other restaurants. Stupidly at 18, I went to college for a week, decided I didn't like it, never went back, failed out of class, wasted the money. I worked for a hotel reservation company. Every single one of those jobs, I had to be empathetic to the customer. I've always done very well where I work. I had a, a customer call me that... They had been upsold to PDAs for their foreman in the field in contracting. Of the many that had been delivered, more than half were broken. Now, he had insurance. I agreed that the person should not have sold them a PDA for a foreman. For the general contractor, fine. For this guy who owned the company, fine. Think about it as D.R. Horton or Pulte Homes. The CEO, their staff, anyone who works at the office, PDAs are great. All of them have a smartphone now. For the people out in the field building the houses, they probably all have an iPhone. They never carry it with them. Except this is pushing 20 years ago. At that time... They had to have their phones, the foremans did, so that the GC and the others above them could get in contact with the foreman. 
make sure the job was going right. And they had a lot of phones parked. First thing I said is, I am very sorry to hear that. We're going to make this right. The second I said, we're going to make this right, the man calmed down exponentially. I said, I need to go to my supervisor and possibly his to work out how we're going to make this right. What is your number that you will be available at today and tomorrow where I can either reach you or leave you a message with a way to reach me? Took down the information, took down all of the details on paper, instantly threw myself in the meeting, went and grabbed my supervisor. We grabbed a, a small meeting room. I told him what, was, what had happened. I told him everything, including who upsold a general contractor to sell PDAs to foremen of contractor jobs. I said, honestly, I'd like to just have him return them all, and we can send him beefier devices. Think of it as the, well, they, they always called them mil spec, but they're, they're not really. They're, what they are is a candy bar phone. They don't, they don't flip close. That's really all you had in the days. You had a candy bar or a flip. Technically, an iPhone is a candy bar. It doesn't flip close. You just kill the screen. Now, these candy bars I was talking about are about that thick, squared, about that tall, I know that doesn't really help you. Maybe inch and a half, two inches thick, square, three, three and a half, four inches tall. They made of extremely thick plastic and rubber on the outside. These were made for job sites. I had one when I worked in Home Depot. I was up on a cherry picker. For those who don't know what it is, this is the one that you see at Lowe's or Home Depot or any other home improvement warehouse where it's not just a forklift. It has a pallet on it, but the pallet, when, I'm, when I was driving, it would be behind me, not in front of me. And when I extend it up, I would go up with it. This is used in about 80% of the departments because we would have individual items. Okay, It wouldn't be a pallet of ceiling fans. It would be ceiling fans that we had taken off the pallet and stacked in the high shelves. I need one. I need two. I'd get the ladder or the cherry picker and go up and get them. I was up on that, fully extended up, and I dropped my phone. Pinballed through three shelves, slid out, got jammed under another shelf to where they actually had to rock the shelf back to get it out. It was dusty. That was the phone I was talking about. My boss couldn't approve it, so we wrangled his boss in. An hour later, I explained the whole thing again. And I told him, this is an 80 to 100 line account. And we're going to lose 80% of it to a competitor for his foreman if we don't do this. But if we do this, we will have gained a customer for a long, long time. He didn't hesitate. Do it. I said, thank you. I had his signature on the form that I was going to hold on to so that if I got asked why I approved it, I could show. Here's where my boss's boss said it was okay. Called the guy back, got his voicemail. I was still on for several hours. Told him, here's the number to call you. Ask for me. If they can't get you to me right away, leave a, leave a number. I will call you back as soon as I'm off my call. Naturally, he called back while I was on a call. I get a message. Here's a number of this guy. I called him. I said, I got it done. You're going to send me every one of those PDAs. I'm going to send you contractor-grade phones. And I went through every line, and I said, okay, what are the lines I'm bringing back? Because I have to mark them as these are coming in, and we're going to send you phones that are activated and charged. A week later, I get a phone, I get a phone call from my boss. That man had called and talked for probably 30 minutes about how grateful he was for me to do that. Now, you call Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, any of them, they don't care. You're locked into a contract. You leave, they still get their money. They'll rope some other sap in off the street. Hey, man, free iPhone. Free Galaxy Tab. And they'll get some other idiot to replace me. I honestly wish I could just give up the cell phone. Put a landline in my house so that I have a way to call and order a pizza if I want. 
And I have a way to call 911 if I need it. And I have a way for people to call me. I would have a landline with a cassette tape run answering machine. And I would be happy. But I can't do that because my parents need me accessible. My boss needs me accessible. Other people need me accessible. We're locked. Just like we're locked into this mask crap. Doctors will tell you, masks don't block viruses. That's not why they wear them when they are treating patients. That's not why they wear them when they're in surgery. It is for larger expectorant or sweat. You ever want to look at why they wear those and why someone's there to sponge their brow? You typically see sweat form on the forehead, right around the nose and mouth, or run down the sides of your face. If you're sweating right here, it's going to run to the, this. Sweat follows gravity. So it's either just going to go here or here. Now, the assistant can sponge the brow as much as they want. The mask, they do that so that if they have anything that accumulates on their lips or whatever, the mask catches it. And they throw that mask away when they're done. Nolan Nurse said it best on Twitter. People are getting sick because of the mask because, one, they're not wearing them correctly. Two, they're always touching the mask, which just gets everything you've just touched on that mask. My keyboard, I could Lysol it every day and it would still be filthy by the end of the day, just from all the crap in the air. I don't like to touch my face. Yes, I know. I do that. I'm probably going to end up shaving just because it's getting itchy. You can tell it's not growing in. But I don't like that because I know everything I've touched is then transferred into my beard. And inevitably, if I have to scratch, like I really need to scratch my beard, I'll scratch my beard on the way to the restroom so I can wash my face and then wipe down my beard. I do the same after I eat. I make sure I wipe my face really good, wash my hands really good before I do that. Because I know that's a crumb catcher just the way it is. But I'm not allowed to make that choice. I am forced by people in power who are not doctors to do something because I can't give up my livelihood. And I'm not going to blame ultimately my boss because she has no choice. Ultimately, even the upper management has no choice. The government is saying these things. Go back to January, February, March. There is video of Dr. Fauci. There is absolutely no reason to be walking around with a mask. Right out of his own mouth. But a couple of months later, when they want to keep the economy shut down, masks are required. Because if you don't make people wear a mask, they can open their business. But if, you're gonna, if you make them wear a mask and limit how many people can go into their business, you can keep the economy shut down. It's always about power and control and money. Fauci's not missing a paycheck. Pelosi, Schumer, Feinstein, Waters, Booker, Nadler, Harris. None of them are missing a paycheck. They're still living high on the hog. And any rhinos who aren't op opposing them at every stage, just as guilty. I love watching Gilmert gets as they go after these people. As they rip into, as Jim Jordan, when he rips into people. Because they are the extreme minority trying to hold the majority accountable for their actions. And that's, to get back again to my original topic, that's what we need when it comes to businesses that don't provide the service they should. It used to be you voted with your wallet. You just tell a few close friends about a, an experience that should not have happened, and that business sees their profits go way, way down. Now boycotts have become political 99% of the time. Some unhinged liberal decides, Chick-fil-A's founder said something that is a personal belief. We should bankrupt the company that he no longer even runs. Goya decided uh, to let their CEO speak his own mind. We should bankrupt them. Those, those fail every time. 
Every time Chick Fil A gets boycotted, their profits go up. Goya profits going up. Starbucks, you don't even have to call for a boycott. When the news comes out that they said they're going to hire ten thousand refugees, and Black Raffle Coffee said we're going to hire ten thousand veterans. Look at which one had their sales go through the roof. For crying out loud, for a month or more after that, you couldn't order Black Raffle Coffee. But there was always at least two or three open tables at Starbucks. I haven't darkened the door or the drive through of a Starbucks since before I graduated college over ten years ago. Don't miss it at all. I keep Earl Grey and Irish breakfast tea in my home. I have some bags I will be keeping at my desk at my office so that I can have a cup of tea. I can't stand coffee. I order it for my nephew and my dad. I drink tea. Must be the Irishman of me. But those are working. Starbucks. Kroger, not Kroger, Target, when they said you can use whatever bathroom you want, within a couple of months, they were already canceling expansion plans because their profits would not sustain those plans. You don't believe we can still vote with our wallet. Just look at things like that. Okay? I don't care, on a personal level, what you say you are. I believe in biology. Humans are either male or female. Biologically. Biologically, inside, you can either cause the fertilization of a human egg, or you can gestate that human egg. One is male, one is female. You choose to live as the other, that's fine. But if you're a six foot one biological male choosing to wear a dress, and you want to walk into a women's restroom where there are petite women and female children, I have a problem with that. If you don't feel comfortable in the men's room, use the family restroom where it's a single stall. It's that simple. It's that simple. As soon as people started opening this up, we had reports of people taking photos across, over stall, uh, over or under the dividers of stalls in these bathrooms. We had a man arrested in a clothing store for taking pictures of a young girl in the uh, dressing room next door. Everything that was predicted happened. And the companies allowing it suffered. But not enough. I mean, honestly, I would love to see Gavin Newsom's winery go broke because no one is buying his wine for the simple reason that as governor of California, he decreed all wineries have to close, then exempted his own. I don't drink wine, so I was never a customer of his. Anyway, the couple of bottles I bought, Australian, one give us to me that it was imported from Germany. I'm not buying California wine, so I don't worry about it. But when they do this, they need to be told it's wrong. But it doesn't happen. But when employees treat the customers like dirt, nothing happens. If you don't see the problem in that, you got some growing up to do. I've talked long enough. We've gone on 15 minutes. My voice is getting tired, and you can probably hear it. Make sure to let me know what you think in the comments. As always, be civil. We're not here to scream and yell, rant and rave, insult and act like toddlers. We're here to discuss, dissent, and debate like civil adults. And we can do that. Please do. Please also remember to like and share the video so that the algorithm knows what you like. and Share it so others see it, and we may be able to grow the channel. I'm doing the giveaway still. 500, 1,000, 1,500 subscribers. Choice of one of three books, choice of two of three books, and all three of those books at 500,000, Until next time, have a wonderful day.